Hi there, and welcome to part two of A Feast for Crows Explained. If you haven't watched part one yet, please click the link above. Now, picking up from where we left off last time. Chapter 16. An honor procession flanks Lord Tywin's casket as it heads west. Led by many of the Lannister Bannermen. Jamie Lannister falls in with his uncle Kevin, and they discuss the raid on salt pans. Jamie cautions his uncle not to try and take on Sandor Clegane or Beric Dondarrion, and that he would have made a good hand. Kevin rejects him coolly and lets Jamie know he knows about the relationship of the twins, Jamie and Cersei. As Jamie returns to King's Landing, he looks upon the encamped Lannister army, which will soon board the Red Wind fleet to lay siege to Dragonstone. He finds his sister in her solar as Grand Maester Pycelle delivers news that Sir Bronn has named Lolly's bastard newborn Tyrion. Jamie realizes that his sister may have Bronn killed for this jape and he recalls the look on her face the night of Tommen's wedding. When the Tower of the Hand was aflame. This called to mind the madness of King Ares and the way he would become aroused by fire. Jamie recalls Ares' rape of his wife the evening he had Lord Chester burnt alive. Jamie had the guard of the Queen's bedchamber when she was screaming for her husband to stop. When Jamie said that they were sworn to protect her too, his partner that night Sir Jonathan Darry replied, We are, but not from him. Jamie asks to speak with Cersei alone and asks her why she keeps Lady Tanya around all the time, knowing that she is a spy for Marjorie. Cersei responds that Tanya is more her spy, considering that the Queen Regent can do more for the Merryweather family. Jamie cautions that she doesn't truly know the woman, but Cersei remarks that she may make Tanya's husband the Hand. After Jamie asks her about the rumour that she plans to name Aureen Waters her new master of ships, he recommends that she would be better off naming Paxter Redwin, but Cersei will not put any Tyrell vassals on her small council. Cersei also defends her choice of Quyburn, a disgraced and twisted maester, to join the council. Cersei's growing paranoia and brutality are becoming more evident, and Jamie retorts, you are seeing dwarfs in every shadow and making foes of friends. Uncle Kevin is not your enemy. I am not your enemy. However, Cersei throws him out of her solar in fury. In the White Sword Tower, Jaime speaks with Sir Loras Tyrell, asking him what he knows of certain famous Kingsguard. Loras is well versed, but when Jaime mentions some lesser known Kingsguard, the Knight of Flowers does not recognize their names. Jamie points out that all of them served well, perhaps even better than the famous knights. Loras remarks that the great Kingsguard knights will always be remembered as heroes. But Jamie reminds him that the most infamous will also be remembered, and then there are those who are not easily classified, of which he offers an example, Kristen Cole, the Kingmaker. Chapter 17. After yet another group presents her with a dwarf's head that is not Tyrion's, Cersei walks together with Kyburn to meet the small council. The new Master of Whisperers indicates that he has prepared the skull in an ebony box for delivery to Prince Doran, but no mention is made that it belongs to Gregor Clegane. Pycelle is neuropopoleptic upon hearing that Kyburn has been raised to Lord and has replaced Varys on the council, and Cersei makes it clear how unfit she considers the old Grand Maester. Cersei has finalized her appointments, placing men she considers to be meek and loyal and giving them the titles used in the free cities, thinking that she will have no masters with her in the small council. She now has a small council consisting of Orton Merriweather as Judicator, Master of Laws, Irene Waters as Grand Admiral, Master of Ships, her uncle Kevin's father-in-law, Sir Harris Swift as her hand, this last appointment she considers as a shield against any threat that Sir Kevin may present. The council first discusses the unrest in Sunspear and Prince Doran's letter that he imprisoned the Sand Snakes. Cersei notes that they are sending Balon Swan to Dawn with Kregor's head, as has been promised, but she does not mention that Balon will have another task as well. We also learn that Tyrion's High Septon has died in his sleep, and the council brings up the continuing influx of sparrows into King's Landing stirring up the populace with their preaching of doom and demon worship. 
But Cersei cares not, nor does she care who becomes High Septon. The next topic is a letter by the Lord's Declarant in the Vale of Arryn. But the Queen Regent decides not to intervene directly on Littlefinger's behalf, but only send a letter warning these lords that no harm must come to Lord Peter. When the subject of rebuilding the fleet comes up, Cersei is adamant against making any pact with the Ironborn, stating, Their turn will come once we have dealt with Stannis. Arrain Waters will get his fleet of Drummonds, however, and Cersei will find the coin by deferring the crown's debt to the Faith of the Seven, and to the Iron Bank of Bravos until the end of the war. Pycelle warns her against this route, cautioning that it would be foolish to make an enemy of the Iron Bank, but the decision is made regardless. The Council also discusses the prudence of making someone pay for the Red Wedding so as to appease all the sparrows, and in the meantime offering whomever succeeds the sure to die soon Lord Walder Frey a chance to rid himself of unwanted brothers, half-brothers and nephews. On the topic of the North, the Council indicates that Stannis may soon be confronted by Roose Bolton's army once his bastard son attacks Moat Caitlin from the North allowing the Lord of the Dreadford passage through the Neck. Cersei mentions that Wayman Manderley has taken Davos Seaworth captive after the latter, was sent by Stannis to treat with him. Lord Manderley seeks the favour of the Iron Throne, and the Queen will recommend that he can achieve that favour if he beheads Stannis's hand. When Sansa is mentioned, Cersei shocks the Council into silence with a violent tirade about how she plans to deal with the girl once she is found. In the awkward silence that follows, Cersei also remarks that Lord Bolton possesses Arya Stark and that her marriage to his bastard should appease the North, keeping to herself the fact that Arya Stark is really a steward's whelp, provided by Littlefinger. Next, they debate the fact that the Night's Watch might be joining its might to Stannis, especially now that Jon Snow is their Lord Commander. The Council decides to warn the Watch that the Crown will stop sending men to the Wall, but Kyburn suggests that they do send a hundred men. Cersei picks up on Kyburn's reason for suggesting ostensibly an act of goodwill, and interrupts to indicate that the men sent will really be assassins ordered to remove Ned Stark's bastard. Back in her apartments, Cersei learns from Tanya that Dorcas fancies Osney Kettleblack and also hints that she herself likes dangerous, scarred men. Cersei tries to learn the name of Tanya's old flame, but the Myrish woman is evasive. When Osni arrives, Cersei butters him up with an offer to join the Kingsguard and a chance to bed her again, provided he accomplishes a couple of tasks. First, Cersei wants him to seduce and hopefully bed Queen Marjorie. This will enable Cersei to execute her lawfully. Second, she plans to send him to the Wall as punishment for his treason with Marjorie, but in reality, he'll lead a group of men to assassinate Jon Snow. She assures him that the men would not be required to serve in the Watch after they complete their task, and promises him a lordship should he accomplish both missions. Later that night, Cersei asks Lord Tanya to remark to Marjorie that she has a secret admirer, but not to let out Sir Osney's name unless the girl probes. Chapter 18. Victorian has left the defence of Moat Caitlin to Ralph Kenning and sailed the Iron Fleet to Oldwick for the Kingsmoot. When the fleet arrives at Naga's Cradle, Victorian has them blockade Euron's silence. The first to greet him on the shore is Aaron, and later that night the priest is at his side for the feast. Several captains pledge their voice to Victorian's claim, but Bela Blacktide seeks a king who will end the wars, saying, Balon was mad, Arion is madder, and Euron is maddest of them all. Soon, the captain finds his niece, advising her not to lay forth a claim, because a woman has no place ruling the Ironborn. Asha stands by her claim and notes that the Dampier may have underestimated the appeal of the King's Moot, since the drum will present his claim and there is talk of Mehron Voldmark being presented as heir of the throne by Tarrell, the thrice drowned. While it is apparent that Aaron's intent was to legitimize Victarion as Balon's successor, their chant is interrupted by the arrival of Euron, 
Victarion notes Euron does not seem to have aged in almost three years that he has been gone. Arion confronts Euron with the accusation that no godless man may sit the sea stone chair, but Euron cows his brother into leaving the hole. Asha then accuses her uncle of the death of her father, but Euron denies he had anything to do with it. When a fight nearly breaks out between Asha and one of Euron's men, Victarion steps in and demands that Euron leave. After his departure, Victarion and his niece walk outside, and Asha asks why Euron was banished by her father, for he refused to ever speak of it. Victarion eventually tells her that Euron impregnated Victarion's wife. Victarion wanted to kill his brother, but Balon forbid it and sent Euron to exile. Later, Victarion killed his wife with his own hands. Asha offers to set aside her claim if Victarion will name her his hand of the king and end the war. She feels that the Ironborn have overextended themselves and tells her uncle that she has reached an agreement with Lady Sibel Glover and that their people may keep Sea Dragon Point and the Stony Shore in return for the release of Deepwood Mott, Torren Square and Moat Caelan. Victarion is not receptive. Asha replies that she then will claim the throne. Chapter 19. Aaron is wading in the ocean, berating himself for running from Euron. He considers Naga's bones, where the Grey King ruled for a thousand years and warred against the Storm God. At dawn, Aaron has his drowned men sound the drums and war horns to announce the onset of the King's Moot on Oldwick. The Prophet wishes for Victarion to win the claim and hopes Euron will make a mistake and declare early. The first claimant is Galbert Farwind, who rules a small barrier island far to the west of the Iron Islands, where skin changers are said to live. Aaron sees madness in the Lord's eyes. He offers to lead the Iron Men to a bountiful land beyond the Sunset Sea. Few of the gathered captains shout his name. Next up is Eric Ironmaker, who once might have made a great king, but age and his immense weight make him an easy target for Asha to dismiss by asking him to stand up from his chair. The following claimant is another famous ironborn, Lord Dunstan Drum, who asks the gathering, where is it written that our king must be a kraken? But the drum's downfall is the cheap loot he offers to swing the vote of the captains. Victarion steps forth next and asks for Arion's blessing. His speech is short and concise and he offers to continue the rule his brother Balon set. His offerings are generous, and many captains give him their voice, but it is Asha who interrupts the shouts of Victarion, and declares that her claim is best, as she is Balon's daughter. She tells the Ironborn that war is bleeding their people, and to continue it would be folly. She offers peace with the Northmen, and prosperous land on the western shores of the north. When she opens her chests to show the scant spoils of her warring in the north, the dolment of support she receives is staggering. Fearing that a woman will win the king's moot, Aaron is shocked back to reality by the harrowing bellowing of a horn. All eyes turn to a giant war horn bound with ancient Valerian glyphs being sounded by one of Euron's mongrels. After sounding the horn several times, the giant mute nearly falls over his lips bloody and blistering. Euron steps forward and announces that he has sailed further and braved more than any other Iron Man. He offers not only peace and land, but all of Westeros to the Ironborn. When Asha asks him how he means to do so, her uncle responds that he will use dragons to conquer the Seven Kingdoms, as Aegon the Conqueror did. Using the dragon horn he found amongst the ashes of old Valyria, when he tells the crowd that the horn can bind dragons to his will, and that he knows where three dragons can be found, he receives the overwhelming cheers of Euron, Crow's Eyes, Euron, King. Chapter 20. On the way to the cove where Nimble Dick led the fool and his two companions, Pod catches Dick looking through Brienne's saddlebags. She knew something like this might happen, and warned Pod to keep an eye on him, but having no recourse but to follow Dick, Brienne and Pod continue on their path to Cracklaw Point. Dick tells them some of the history of the region to pass the monotony of their journey. Brienne's mistrust of Dick has made him take notice and she considers how easy it is for her 
to suspect others after the mistreatments she has suffered in her life. She remembers getting her revenge on several of her false suitors during the melee at Bitterbridge, but this has done little to stay her natural distrust. As they pass the Diadem, Lord Brune's castle, Pod takes note of a rider a couple miles behind them. When Brienne learns that Dick may have known Lord Brune, she considers the possibility that Dick is a deserter from the war. After passing through many a treacherous bog and forest, they finally arrive at the ruins of the Whispers. Brienne commands Pod to watch their horses as she and Dick investigate the ruins. When they find a recently put out cook fire, Brienne realizes their quarrel is still around. The trap is soon sprung and the fool turns out to be Shagwell of the Bloody. Murmurs. Shagwell kills Nimble Dick with his brutal Morningstar, then informs Brienne that Uswick rode south to Old Town with some of the Murmurs, while Rorge headed for Saltpans. He also reveals a rumour that the daughter of Lord Stark has last been seen with Sandor Clegane. When Shagwell's two companions attack, Brienne's strength and size are too much for Pike and Timon, who fall quickly to her strokes with Oathkeeper. Squaring off against Shagwell, the fool is struck in the head by a stone thrown by Podrick. Brienne forces the fool to dig a grave for Dick, but upon completion of it, the former brave companion attacks her. She quickly dispatches him as well. After killing him, she leaves two gold dragons on Dick's grave, and is then surprised to hear a laugh from the ruined wall. It is Sir Hyle Hunt, the rider who Pod had spied, sent by Randall Tully to stay at Brienne's side in the off chance that she finds Sansa. Chapter 21. At a hidden well at Shandystone in the Desert of Dawn, Ariane and her most trusted companions are awaiting the arrival of Marcilla and her sworn sword. Although Ariane has the utmost trust in Garen, Dre, and Sylvia, she is still unsure about Gerald Dane, the Dark Star. She considers his cruel nature and the mystery surrounding him. She is worried that Ares may be wary of him, but if this would happen and they would to come to blows, who would win? Garen warns Ariane that he does not like the man, but she reminds him that they may need his sword and eventually his castle. Later Darkstar tells her that this scheme to crown Marcilla will not work as she has planned. He then unsheaths his sword and reveals that you incite a war with steel, meaning they should kill Marcilla. When Ares and Princess Marcilla arrive, Ariane introduces the girl to her companions. Marcilla recalls the great knight, Arthur Dane, when she meets Darkstar, which seems to upset the knight of High Hermitage, because in his mind, people always remember his cousin for his famous sword. Ares draws Ariana off alone and reveals that Tywin Lannister is dead. They set off at night for the Greenblood, where they will take an orphan's barge west along the river. Marcilla is confused, having been told nothing by Ares, especially the fact that everyone keeps calling her your grace. Ariana tells her some of their plan, that they intend to crown her queen because her brother Tommen was being controlled by evil counselors. During the trip, Marcilla asks Garen why they call him an orphan of the green blood when he has a mother and father. He explains that it is a metaphor for their mourning the loss of their homeland and the mother river, the Rhoyne. They built barges along the green blood and hammered them together as they did in their ancestral land, for they were never comfortable in the Dornish deserts. As Ariane is considering her plan to crown Marcilla at Hellholt, where Ilaria Sand's father, Harmon Ulla, rules, they reach the river and spot the barge that Garen's people promised would be waiting. But as they get closer, Aria Hotar steps from the cabin with a dozen crossbowmen. Ariane yells for them to flee, while Dre recommends they yield. But Ares Oakheart charges the boat, intent on protecting his two princesses at all costs. Hit with several bolts, he reaches the deck but falls to Captain Hotar's long axe. As Ariana falls off her horse screaming, No! She hears Marcilla shrieking, and Hotar commanding horsemen to chase after Darkstar, who fled. Ariana notices Marcilla on her hands and knees, her head in her hands and blood streaming down her ears. Then she is brought before Hotar, pleading to know how her father discovered what she planned. 
The captain of the guard responds, Someone told. Someone always tells. Chapter 22. Every day, the kindly man asks Arya who she is. When she replies, no one, he tells her that she lies, trying to get her to forget her true self and give up her past. But Arya resists. She works hard in the temple, cleaning and doing other chores. She witnesses many people entering the temple, some to light candles, others to curl up near a statue to die, and others to speak in private to the kindly man. When asked whose name she whispers at night, she finally admits that there are people she wants to kill, but the priests tell her that it is the many-faced God who determines who shall die, not her. He also finally convinces her to dispose of her possessions, and she does so with all but needle, which she hides outside the temple under a stone. Once she has done this, the kindly man comes to her and tells her some of their history. The faceless men are older than Bravos, having started amongst the slaves working the mines beneath the volcanoes of the Valerian Freehold. The slaves worked hard under the harshest of conditions, and since they came from many different nations, they all prayed to different gods. But one amongst them, although he may have actually been a noble son or an overseer, no one knows, realized that they were actually all praying to one god, one who could set them free from their torture. The kindly man does not finish the story, but now Arya is a novice at the temple, and she and the waif begin to teach each other their respective languages. As Arya learns Bravosi, the waif also teaches her how to read a lie on someone's face, and Arya discovers that the girl is actually well over 30 years old, having taken poisons as part of her sacrifice to become faceless. One day, when other priests of the many-faced god visit the temple, Arya asks the kindly man how to change her face, as Jacqueline Hagar did. While the priest knows not the name, he tells her, it takes years of prayer, sacrifice, and study to accomplish what he could do. Still, Arya wishes to learn, so he tells her to begin training the muscles of her face in front of a mirror every day. The next day, the kindly man tells Arya that she must leave the temple for a while, so as to learn the Bravosi tongue by being amongst them all the time. He instructs her to find a fishmonger named Brusco, but to not reveal who she really is. Arya decides to use the name cat, pretending to be an orphan girl from King's Landing. Chapter 23 Sansa is now completely in the role of Elaine Stone, and she has considerable influence in the Eyrie. On the balcony of her room in the Maiden's Tower, she surveys the armies of the Lord's Declarant camped outside the Gates of the Moon. Lord Gilwood Hunter arrived first, and immediately blockaded supplies from reaching the Eyrie. Though they are not yet under siege, the situation looks dire from her standpoint. Lord Robert, even more irritable than normal because there are no eggs or bacon, tells Elaine that he still hears Marillion singing every night. Elaine assures him that the bard is dead, although she has not seen the body, but she herself no longer hears singing. When Littlefinger arrives, he informs them that the Lord's Declarant are on their way up to the Eyrie for a parley. He tells Elaine that there will be eight of them, but he is only concerned about Lord Corbray. We learn that Lynn fought against John Arryn at Goldtown at the onset of Robert's Rebellion, but later fought alongside him at the Trident, where he slew Prince Lewin, Martell of the King's Guard, and broke the Dornish line. While his elder brother supports Peter's position as Lord Protector of the Vale, Sir Lynn has taken up with the Lord's Declarant, bearing the Valerian steel Lady Fallen. Sir Lynn is dangerous and unpredictable, and quick to demand a duel. The Lord's Declarant seeks to defend Lord Robert and the Vale, but do not acknowledge Peter as the Lord Protector, naming him a false counsellor who has been misruling the Vale. After Robert has another fit, Littlefinger suggests that Maester Coleman try giving him sweet sleep. Although the Maester seems reluctant to do so, Elaine tells her father that Jon Royce will recognize her having met her at Winterfell when Waymar Royce took the black. But Peter explains that men see what they expect to see. She also asks him why he doesn't leave the Vale to take up his position of Lord of Harrenhal. Littlefinger is convinced the place is cursed, 
especially after what happened to Tywin Lannister, Craigor Clegane, and Vargo Hoat. Lady Shella Wint recently died without any heirs, claiming yet another family that once ruled at Black Harren's Nightmare Castle. When Elaine recommends that he give Harrenhal to Lord Walder Frey, Peter smiles and tells her he might, but he would really like to give it to Cersei, although he might have to remove her from the game sooner than planned, unless she removes herself first. Elaine leads the Lord's Declarant up to Peter's Sola, where he confounds them by saying, My lords, I am with you, heart and hand. Show me where to sign, I beg you. But Jon Royce tells him they did not come to obtain his signature, but remove him from the Eyrie. Then Peter counters by offering to foster the sons of other lords and asks Lady Wainwood to send Harold Harding to the Eyrie as his ward. But the lords scoff at this request. Littlefinger refuses their demand that he leave the Vale and turn over Robert. And after he calls their bluffs of violence, Lynn Corbury draws Lady Fawnlorn. But this enrages the other lord's declarant. And Bronze Yon tells the knight to remove his steel, reminding him they are guests. Corbray stalks off, but this has worked to Littlefinger's advantage, as he now turns hostile towards the lords, demanding that they lift their encampment and give him one year to set the veil to right, or else he will definitely step down as Lord Protector. All the lords except Yon Royce agree, and Peter emerges victorious in the parley. Later that night, after the lords have departed, Elaine asks Peter what he plans for the next year. Littlefinger continues his tutelage of Elaine in playing the Game of Thrones. He states that one or two of the older lords may die over the course of the year, and Lord Gilwood Hunter may well be killed by his younger brother, Harlan, who arranged old Eon's death. Peter admits that he will never be able to sway Bronze Yon, but when Elaine inquires about Sir Lynn, he tells her, Sir Lynn will remain my implacable enemy. He will speak of me with scorn and loathing to every man he meets, and lends his sword to every secret plot to bring me down. That was when her suspicion turned to certainty. And how shall you reward him for this service? Littlefinger laughed aloud, with gold and boys and promises of course. Chapter 24 Cersei continues to obliviously move from one folly to the next and is angered by Tommen's request to sit the Iron Throne and attend small council meetings. She realises that Marjorie put him up to this. Cersei refuses to give her power up to anyone, at least until Tommen comes of age. Next, she sends away the Iron Bank's envoy, Noho Domitius, after telling him there'll be no payment until the rebellion is ended. She receives word from Pycelle that Lord Manderley had Sir Davos beheaded, and the phrase confirmed this. Later, she speaks with Osmond Kettleblack about his younger brother's failed efforts to bed Marjorie. Osmond swears that the young queen likes him, but that they are never alone. The Kingsguard names some of those always around her, including the male singers she prefers to entertain her and her companions. When Cersei crosses the yard and finds Tommen riding at the Quinton, she is infuriated. Once again, this was Marjorie's idea. And while all those gathered are cheering the young king's jousting ability, Cersei blunders by saying, One day you shall rule the lists, as your father did. Marjorie astutely catches this and asks what tourneys King Robert had won. The Queen Regent evades this by mentioning Robert's deeds at the Trident. She then berates Loras for teaching Tommen how to ride, but the King's Guard reminds her that there has been no master at arms at the Red Keep since Aaron Santagar was killed. Walking back to her Sola, she considers sending for another Dornish master at arms just to irk the Tyrells. In her Sola, Kyburn informs her that Prince Doran has imprisoned Daemon Sand for demanding the release of the Sand Snakes, and that Sylvia Santagar has been hastily married to the elderly Eldon Estimant. He also tells her that both Daemon Sand and Sylvia are close friends of Doran's daughter, Ariana. Cersei could not care less, but she is interested to hear of a treasonous puppet show. She commands Kyburn to have the four puppeteers put to death, but Kyburn wants the woman for his experiments. Cersei has already given him Senel, but he tells her she didn't last. The Queen Regent recalls her screaming in the darkness when she was down in the black cells. 
but grants Kyburn his test subjects. Later, she is bathing in preparation for dinner. Jamie arrives with Tommen, who is demanding to see her. The boy king wants his horse tomorrow so that Loris can continue training him, but his mother will have none of it. Jamie mocks her for suggesting that Sir Osmond is thrice the knight Sir Loris is, but Sir Ursley finally convinces her son to wait for a new master at arms to be named. As she gets dressed, Cersei recalls her fit of rage when her washerwoman shrunk several of her gowns. But it is obvious she is unaware that she is actually gaining weight from all the alcohol. Her guests for dinner are Felice Stokeworth and her husband Bowman Bridge. It is revealed that Tanda Stokeworth has been thrown from her horse and fractured her hip. But Cersei thinks to herself that Tanda will not recover from the wound at her age. Felice says she was refused hospitality by the ward of the Lord Gylus Rosby and that she encountered ruffians on the road. Cersei deftly convinces Felice and Bauman that she fears Bronn is either hiding Tyrion or gathering swords for him and may mean to try and kill Tommen. They assure her that it was solely Bronn's responsibility for naming Lully's bastard son Tyrion, but Bowman gets the hint that Cersei would like to see the ex sword killed and tells her not to worry any further. On her way to bed, Cersei peeks in on Tommen and sees three kittens in bed with him. Merrin Trant informs her that Marjorie gave them to him. That night, Cersei thinks of Prince Rhaegar Targaryen and how King Aerys blocked their betrothal out of spite. When she was 10, her father and her aunt Jenna promised she would be betrothed to Rhaegar after the tourney for King Aerys II in Lannisport. She was so happy that she agreed to visit the witch Maggie the Frog with her friends. They laughed at her prophecies, but that night King Aerys mocked Lord Tywin for thinking he would give his son's hand to his servant Tywin's daughter. And after that, Maggie's predictions started to come true, one after another. Chapter 25. Returning to Maidenpool, Hyel Hunt informs Randall Tarly that Brienne has killed three of the Bloody Murmurs, Tali again warns her against playing a knight, but Brienne will not give up her mission. She and Podrick meet up with Sir Hyle the next morning, and he tells them of his plan. For finding Sandor Clegane, he reveals that the Hound has not joined Beric Bondarian, and that the Lightning Lord's band had no part in the raid on Saltpans. Lord Tali has created this rumour in hopes of turning the small folk against Lord Beric. Sir Hyle knows a Septon with great knowledge of the Riverlands, and proposes that they accompany the man to Saltpans. When Brienne says she has no intention of travelling with Hunt, he tells her that he is no longer in Lord Tarly's service. They soon depart for Saltpans. While Septon Merrybold talks of the gods, his past and the great bands of wolves in the Riverlands, led by a demon of a she-wolf, Marybold tells them that they may encounter broken men traumatised by their experiences in war on their way to Quiet Isle. And Brienne summarises that the Septon himself once had such an experience before he discovered his piety. Chapter 26 Staying at an inn in Bravos, Sam is nearing wit's end. Darien has abandoned them for the brothels. Gilly remains inconsolable and Maester... Aemon's health deteriorates daily. To make matters worse, Sam had spent nearly all their coin on their rooms, a healer for Amon and passage on a boat, Lady Ashenora, that they wound up unable to board due to the maester's health. Feverish and dying, the maester begs Sam to return to the docks to learn more about this rumour of dragons that Darien had heard at some wine sink. Amon mumbles to Sam, Dragons, the grief and glory of my house. My brothers dreamed of dragons too, and the dreams killed them, every one. Sam, we tremble on the cusp of half-remembered prophecies. I should have seen it. Fire consumes, but cold preserves the wall. Sam departs that night to find Darien, but gets accosted by two bravosi because he is wearing a sword. However, he is saved by Cat of the Canals, who tells him of another black brother about to wed the sailor's wife. Sam finds Darien at the Happy Port, but his brother from the Watch wants nothing more to do with the Black, or Gilly and Aemon, for that matter. Sam punches him in the face, but gets tossed into the canal by the proprietors of the brothel. He is saved from drowning by Zondo, a huge summer islander 
who was a mate aboard the Cinnamon Wind, and knows of these dragons that Sam had mentioned. Chapter 27. Aware that Cersei is trying to rid herself of him, Jaime argues that his place is beside the king, not off laying siege to Riverrun, but his sister responds that she can't rely on Davon, despite naming him Warden, and needs Jaime to defeat Brendan Tully, as well as find out why Gregor's men at Harrenhal have not released Wireless Manderley, as the Crown requested. She states that Osmond Kettleblack will command the King's Guard in his absence. Although Jamie dislikes the idea, Jamie's command consists of Kenos, Dermot, Strong Boar, Red Ronnet, as well as Ilan Payne and Adam Marbrand, whom Jamie demanded as concessions from his sister. On the first night, they guessed at Castle Hayford, and Jamie considers the fate of his cousin Tyrek, who would be Lord of the Castle were he not missing. He thinks it possible the boy is still alive, perhaps having been secreted off by command of Varys, who very well could have known that the riot would occur. Starting that night, Sir Jamie begins training every night with ill and pain, in the hopes that he can become a proficient swordsman with his left hand. The company also visits So's Horn and meets with Sir Roger Hogg, arriving at Harrenhal. Jamie has Clegane's men release all prisoners, including Wireless Manderley, and then leave Sir Boniface Hasty and the Holy Hundred to hold the castle, until Peter Baelish takes up its lordship. Jamie commands Boniface to kill Sandor Clegane or Thoris of Mir if either are captured, but requests he send him any bloody murmurs or Beric Dondarrion should they fall into his hands. Outside, Jamie comes across Ronet Cunnington, who mentions how he was once betrothed to Brienne. When Ronet mocks Brienne, Jamie hits him in the face with his golden hand and insists he calls her by name. Chapter 28. Cersei and Tanya share the Queen's litter en route to the Great Sept of Baelor. The Lady from Mia is telling Cersei about all the men who are always around Marjorie and how she was present for the bedding at Renly's wedding. Although Tanya is not sure if Marjorie is still a maiden, she affirms that Renly was aroused. She also lets on that besides all the knights and bards, Pycelle is a frequent visitor of the young queen, and her brother Loris visits perhaps more than any other. They also discuss the new High Septon, a man who was once a sparrow and not a member of the most devout. This is not only surprising, but also a concern to Cersei, and considers that she may have to poison this new leader of the Seven if he becomes unruly. Reaching the top of Visenya's hill, the Queen's litter can continue no further as the streets are packed with sparrows. Continuing on foot, Cersei considers Pycelle's objection to her choice of Osfrid Kettleblack to replace Adam Marband as the commander of the City Watch. She takes note of all the bones and skulls piled up around the statue of Baelor and is told that they are the remains of septons and scepters who were killed by the war because they received no protection from the throne. At the doors to the Great Sept, armed men block the Kingsguard's entry since they bear weapons. Cersei must enter alone, and as she does, she wonders about the anointed knights answering the call to defend the faith. Inside the Sept, she is appalled to find Septon Reynard in roughsman robes scrubbing the floors, and learns that Septon Torbet has been imprisoned for being obese when so many are starving. She berates the new High Septon, this sparrow wearing frayed robes and standing before her barefoot. He tells her that the Faith has sold the crown her father gave his predecessor, as well as all the valuables in their vaults, in order to help feed the poor. Cersei recalls Kyburn's report that the sparrows broke down the doors of the Sept before the final vote with axes in their hands and their leader on their shoulders. She now understands how this man was elected High Septon. Speaking in private, the priest reprimands her for beheading Ned Stark on the steps of the Great Sept, and reveals that he hasn't come to the Red Keep to bless King Tommen because he is still praying for guidance from the Seven to affirm that the boy is the rightful king. Cersei begins to seethe with anger, but concedes to his concerns that the holy men and women on the roads need protection from rape and murder. Cersei agrees to have Tommen rearm the faith something King Magor forbade almost 300 years ago. She promises to restore the faith militant for which the High Septon will acknowledge Tommen as king and forgive the crown's debt to the faith. 
Back in her litter, Cersei tells Tanya of her triumph. With one stroke, she has gotten the faith to bless Tommen, reduce the throne's step by almost a million dragons, and clear the city of sparrows by restoring the warrior's sons and the poor fellows. Yet, she doesn't realize the repercussions of what she has set in motion. On the way back to the Red Keep, Cersei's litter encounters Marjorie's entourage returning from a horse ride and picnic. Marjorie tells Cersei that she should share some of the burden of ruling the realm, but Cersei laughs at her, especially when the young queen tells her she is always well protected by her brother Loras when she goes riding. Chapter 29 Victorian Greyjoy's iron victory has rammed one of the longships of the Shield Island. Victorian kills Sir Talbot Surrey of South Shield. Although the Raver's hand is wounded during the battle, the Ironborn's massive fleet is soon victorious in taking the shields, which sit at the mouth of the Mandor north of the city of Old Town. It is Victorian's command that won the battle, but it will be King Euron they cheer for, engineering their bold attack. Back in his cabin, as the dusky woman Euron gave him tends his wounds, Victorian recalls Aeron's words that he would find a way to remove Euron from the sea stone chair. He remembers how he helped capture Lord Baylor Blacktide, who had refused to acknowledge Euron after the king's moot on Oldwick, and paid for it with his life. Asha, however, had escaped the Iron Islands along with those loyal to her, landing at Lord Hewitt's town on Oakenshield. The Lord Captain meets the reader and the drum. Both are worried that Euron's little conquest will bring ruin down upon them, as surely Highgarden will respond. At the feast, Victorian notes that Euron has shamed Lord Humphrey Hewitt and his wife and daughters. King Euron then raises Harris Harley, Andric the Unsmiling, Marin Volmark, and Newt the Barber to Lords of the Four Shields, effectively stealing away the lieutenants of his adversaries. Euron declares that they will sail the next day with provisions plundered from the Shield Islands, selling the slaves that they had just taken in the Free Cities on their way to find the dragons he had promised. But Roderick and many of the captains object, stating that they should attack Old Town or the Arbor, and Euron stalks from the hall. Soon, one of Euron's bastard sons tells the Iron Captain that the king wishes to see him. In his room, Euron tells his brother that... The reader was correct, that the whole fleet could never reach Slaver's Bay together. He believes that the Iron Fleet alone could, however, and promises his brother the Sea Stone Chair as a reward if he sails to Slaver's Bay and returns with Daenerys. Euron means to marry her and ascend to the Iron Throne, with Lord Blacktide's words that Euron was maddest of them all on his mind. Victorian agrees to go, thinking to himself, you stole my wife and despoiled her so I'll have yours. Chapter 30. Jamie's small host reaches Castle Derry, and he finds himself contemplating the genius of his uncle Kevin for his choice of a bride for Lancel, Amore Frey, whose mother is a Derry. He has dispatched Red Ronnet to accompany Wireless Manderley to Maidenpool, but nevertheless, he has too many men to be fed at his cousin's new castle. Jamie takes note of all the armed Freys and sparrows in the castle far outnumbering Lannister men. Darry's maester greets Sir Jamie, surprised by this unexpected visit, and tells him that Kevin departed right after the wedding, and that Lancel is praying in the Sept. The maester provides him with Lancel's own room, since Jamie's cousin has taken to sleeping in the Sept. As Jamie bathes before the feast, he notices that Josmin Peckleton, his new squire, wishes to bed Pyre. Jamie tells him to use Lancel's room for his first bedding, saying, You'll feel a lord yourself when you're done, if Pyre knows her business. But Jamie warns him to treat her kindly, perhaps due to his own guilt for refusing the girl when Kyburn sent her during his repercussion at Harrenhal. At the feast, Jamie learns that his cousin has been fasting since the old High Septon died. Lancel also does not join them for dinner. Lady Emery begs Jamie to stay and help them defeat Lord Beric Dondarrion the Hound, and the other outlaws. He learns that the outlaws seem to be following a woman now, cloaked and hooded, and no one has seen Beric Dondarrion for a while. Jamie's companion, Strongbore, claims to be moved by Amy's words, and promises to return after they take Riverrun to sort out the Hound. But Jamie suspects the Hound will kill him, 
Jamie leaves the table and goes to the sept. Three armed sparrows bar his path, but Lancel lets him in. Lancel admits that his father left after they quarrelled, and that he does not intend to consummate his marriage. And then he admits his greatest sins, serving the wine that resulted in King Robert's death, and that he had been sleeping with Cersei, thus proving that Tyrion was not lying about Cersei's infidelity. Lancel states that he plans to forsake his title as Lord of Darry and head to King's Landing to swear vows as a warrior's son. Later, in the yard, Jaime admits to Sir Illyn that he slept with Cersei when she was at Castle Darry with Robert. Cersei wanted him to get to Arya Stark and he would have killed her had he found her first. Sir Illyn Payne laughs at Jaime. And that's it for A Feast for Crows Part 2. In the next video, we'll finish off with chapters 31 to 45. But in the meantime, check out our playlist on every chapter of A Song of Ice and Fire Explained. Also, when you get the chance, try out Fantasy Flights, a Game of Thrones board game, Digital Edition.